Testing, one, two, three, four. Jeremy Bernstein, tape, November 27, side A. Born July 26, 1928. New York City. My father is a doctor. One sister, Barbara, married. Two children, lives in New Jersey, six years younger. Her husband is a lawyer. I was taught to play chess at the age of 12, but did not play seriously until about the age of 17 when I joined the Marshall Chess Club in New York on West 10th Street. I had uh, few intellectual interests. As a child, I uh, uh, was a school misfit and considered uh, you know, reading a book um, schoolwork. And I, I don't think I read a book for pleasure until after I graduated high school. I had one thing I think that uh, that, per that perhaps uh, helped me uh, get over being a misfit, a school misfit, and that is that um, I became interested in photography uh, about the same time, 12 or 13. Uh, I started out by just, you know, getting a camera and learning how to take pictures and learning how to print pictures and learning how to build a dark room and learning how to do all the technical things and uh, so on and so on. And then finally trying to find out how you could uh, sell pictures and become a, you know, would it be possible to be a professional photographer? And it was a case of over a period of, say, from the age of 13 to uh, 17, uh, you might say, uh, going through step by step by myself without anybody really helping me, the problem solving of being I mean, a photographer. And I found that, um, I think, in looking back, that uh, the uh, this particular thing about problem solving is something that uh, schools generally don't teach you, and that uh, if you can develop uh, a kind of generalized approach to problem solving that uh, it's surprising how it helps you in anything so I think that photography might have been more valuable than uh, you know uh, doing the proper things in school and you know most of the English courses that I had consisted of the teacher saying um, you to read five pages of Silas Marner tonight and the next day the class was spent in sitting at the book like Emil Jennings in The Blue Angel, looking up over the book and saying, you know, Mr. Kubrick, and then you stand up and they say, yeah, when Silas Marner walked out of the door, what did he see? And uh, if you didn't know what he saw, you got a zero. <laughs> and, that, and that was it. And as a matter of fact, I failed English once and had to make it up in summer, uh, summer school. Well, I had developed myself as a photographer, and uh, prior to graduating high school, I'd act, I had sold uh, two st picture stories to look. Oh, and I also sold them a picture. I sold them two picture stories and a, and a photograph of a news dealer sitting on 170th Street in the Grand Concourse with all the headlines saying uh, Roosevelt, you know, dies or FDR dead. Yeah. And he was sitting there looking uh, depressed. And uh, they liked this picture and used it in a, uh, a whole series about Roosevelt. And it was sort of the final picture of the of the series. Well, I was a I was apprentice photographer for six months, and then I became a uh, staff photographer, and I was there for four years. And of course, that would have been the you know the period I'd spent in college. And I think that the uh, you know the things, what I learned, and uh, the practical experience uh, in every respect, including photography, what I learned in in that four year period exceeded what I could have learned in school, and. Um, also, getting out of school, I can't remember what was the, the uh, particular turning point, but being out of school, I began to read, and uh, within a relatively short period of time, I would imagine caught up with where I probably should have been had I had a, a modicum of interest in things in high school. Like uh, everybody else, you know, I was always very interested in movies, and I used to go um, to see films. and. Um, I'd say practically every film. It was the post-war Italian uh, sort of uh, the Rossellini pictures, which uh, brought the art houses into existence. So there weren't that many good films that were ever played in, uh, you know, the theaters around, except at the museum. A friend of mine, who subsequently has become a film director named Alex Singer, uh, was working as an office boy at the March of Time, and uh, one day he told me that. Uh, it cost forty thousand dollars to make a march of time and it was a one reeler and i said to him gee that's a lot of money i said uh... 
I can't believe it cost that much to make, you know, eight, eight or nine minutes of film. So I called up uh, Eastman Kodak and checked on the price of film. And then I called up the, <clears throat> the laboratory and found out how much it cost to develop it. And I checked on how much it cost to rent 35 millimeter movie cameras. Then I checked the cost of the other facilities, sound and editing and so forth. And um, uh, I forgot what it added up to, but it was it was um, something like uh, that I could do a documentary film for about uh, $3,500. So I thought, gee, if they're making these pictures for $40,000 and I can make them for $3,500, uh, surely I must be able to sell them and at least get my money back and probably make a profit, you know? So, uh, in fact, I think we thought that we could make a considerable profit because we assumed that if they were making them for $40,000 a piece, that they must be making a profit, you know? And, uh, so, uh, I rented a, uh, 35mm IMO camera, that's spelled E-Y-E-M-O, which is a spring-wound camera produces a professional picture. And I did a, a documentary film um, about a boxer named Walter Cartier, who I had previously done a picture story for Look About, and I knew him. And it was called Day of the Fight. And um, got the whole thing, you know, did, ev did everything. Uh, Alex helped me, you know, sort of carried lights around and assisted me. And I did the whole thing, just myself and Alex. And Walter and his people that he knew and um, cut it and uh, another friend of mine who subsequently has become a professional movie composer named Gerald Freed F-R-I-E-D did a film score and got the whole thing finished in for $3,900 and uh, then when uh, we began to take it around to the various companies to, to sell it they all liked it but we were offered things like $1,500 and $2,500 and so forth at one point I said to them, you know, Christ, uh, uh, why, are you, why are you offering us so little for this? You know, one real shorts, you know, get more than $40,000. And they said, what, are you? you must be crazy. And I said, why do you think that? And the, so I told them about the March of Time. And uh, anyway, they, they, they said it was, you know, was ridiculous. And shortly after that, the March of Time went out of business <laughs> for the reason we later found out that they were spending approximately, I mean, you know, if the March of Time um, sues me for this, Alex somehow found out when he was working there that that it was costing 40000 bucks to make one of their one reelers. And uh, they went out of business. Well, anyway, I finally sold the film to uh, RKO Pathé, who uh, are no longer in business either and uh, sold it for about a hundred dollars less than it cost me to make it. I know it was a small loss, but uh, I had the pleasure of seeing it shown and, uh, you know, I remember I went to the Paramount Theater where it was playing with some Ava Gardner Robert Mitchum picture and, you know, it was very exciting to see it on the screen and it got a nationwide, nationwide and worldwide distribution. And so um, I thought uh, everybody liked it and they thought it was good. And I thought that this would be, uh, I'd get millions of offers, from which I got none to do anything. I uh, made another uh, documentary, this time about a flying priest. Uh, I forgot, or Father Stottmuller or something, in New Mexico, who uh, flew a Piper Cub around to Indian parishes. I know Arkeo thought it was a colorful subject. And so I went there and pretty much on my own again made this short. And uh, still, you know, nothing was happening. And did, did they, were, were they supporting you for this? Or? No, they gave me uh, fifteen hundred dollars, and of which I had to pay for the film, the travel, and everything. I made nothing. I think I lost money on that too. But I, I had been making a reasonably good salary. It looked for four years, so I had a certain amount of money, and I was still working. So then I quit. Look, because I decided that. Um, there obviously wasn't any money in shorts, but that I then found out how much feature films were being made for, and uh, you know millions. And I had calculated that I could make a feature film for about ten thousand dollars. And uh, well, how did you how did you calculate that? Well, again, by you know projecting the amount of film I'd shoot, 
figuring that I could get actors to work for practically nothing. You know, work with, uh, I mean, at this point I was the whole crew, cameraman, assistant cameraman, uh, you know, director, uh, everything. So I had no cost. So a friend of mine in the village uh, did a script about four soldiers from an unnamed country lost behind enemy lines trying to find their way home again. I, I, I didn't really know what I didn't know, and I thought, well, Christ, uh, uh, there really is can't be very much more to making a feature film, and I certainly couldn't make one worse than the films that I kept seeing every week. But uh, I wasn't satisfied to just uh, make a, a, you know, an interesting film. I wanted it to be a very poetic and uh, meaningful film. I got the film made, and uh, but it was uh, a very, very dull, and it got an art house distribution. It was called Fear and Desire, distributed by Joseph Burston, who was the, at one time, I, I think he was the distributor who first brought in Rossellini's pictures. It got a few reasonably good reviews. It got a nice blurb from Mark Van Doren, and uh, who was very kind about it. And it had a few, you know, it had a few good moments in it, but with the exception of uh, one or two of the actors, they were all terrible actors, and I knew nothing about directing <laughs> any actors. Well, how, and, did you, how did you go about directing now? Just sort of. Uh... Well, I just, I don't remember. <laughs> you know, it was really, you know, just, uh, uh, it was really just, uh, well, actually, from some of the so-called professional efforts I've subsequently seen, you know, people doing, I would say I didn't go about it that much differently than a lot of people do, but I didn't really know anything, you know. Uh, but there were, there were some good moments in it, and uh, as I say, it even got a few good reviews. It opened at the Guild Theater in New York, and it was pretty apparent you know, that it was terrible, you know, and uh, while it was still playing, I decided, well, I'd better, uh, I'd better get another script very fast uh, and try to promote some more money on the strength of the, just the fact that the thing was playing, because uh, I, it wasn't apparent to me how I was going to earn a living or do anything, you know, and again, no, not one single offer ever to do anything, you know. In about two weeks, knock together another script with somebody and um, this time it was sort of a reaction to the other one. Uh, this was nothing but action sequences and a more sort of mechanically constructed uh, sort of action gangster plot. Mo Basel uh, co-produced and put up the money to make Killer's Kiss. That was not a great financial success. It was at that time that I was playing chess for quarters in the park. I was playing... Uh, chess for quarters. I mean, I, I was doing it for the fun of it, but I also did make about two or three dollars a day, which uh, it really goes a long way if you're not buying anything except food. How many hours a day were you, uh, were you putting in down there? Well, when I was waiting for things to happen, you know, waiting to get an answer on something which went on for months, you know, sometimes, um, I would go there uh, about 12 o'clock and stay there until, you know, midnight. We formed the company, which was called Harris Kubrick Pictures. After looking for a story, we uh, bought a book called The Clean Break by Lionel White. And this um, was the story that we made into the killing for United Artists. Well, first of all, United Artists' uh, function uh, was only to finance and distribute the films. It was up to us to hire the people and uh, make the film. And uh, I presume that United Artists thought that if uh, The Killer's Kiss could be made, you know, on the semi-professional basis it was, that with an adequate amount of money, which was fairly minimum, you know, we could make a film. Jimmy had to guarantee completion of the movie, which means that if the movie uh, ran over the budget, he had to put up all the extra money, which is a great safeguard. And especially since financially he was responsible to make this kind of a guarantee, uh, it wasn't that much of a risk. Well, we had a very good cast, but um, none of the people were... Uh, big stars in the sense that they uh, were extremely choosy about what they were in. The principal cast was Sterling Hayden, Colleen Gray, uh, Marie Windsor, Elisha Cook Jr., Joe Sawyer, Ted DeCorsia, Vince Edwards. So anyway, we made the killing and um, somehow Dory Sherry saw it and he liked it. He was the first one who uh, really showed any interest in us, so, you know, to the extent of offering us any sort of a deal to make another picture. 
Well, it was really uh, sort of concurrent with this that I remembered reading Paths of Glory. I did a screenplay with Jim Thompson and Calder Willingham, and uh, nobody wanted to do it. It was turned down by every company until uh, our agent, Ronnie Lubin, L-U-B-I-N, interested Kirk Douglas in the project. And uh, through Kirk's interest, uh, United Artists put up the money on uh, the basis of it being done for a very low budget in Europe. The picture was a moderate success. The reviews on it were very good. Many reviews were superlative. And uh, from that point of view, it was an enormous success. The greatest uh, virtue of the film was that I met my wife, Christiana, who uh, was an actress. I was watching a television broadcast and saw her and uh, got in touch with her agent. She came out to the studio. We met. I began dating her. and. We subsequently got married a year later. This is followed by about six months spent working on a script for Kirk Douglas, which he didn't like, and uh, some more months working on something which Gregory Peck was supposed to do for us, which was also abandoned, followed by uh, the offer from Marlon Brando to direct his Western, which resulted in six months of work, again, uh, abandoned as far as I was concerned because I left the project. This was followed by a script called The German Lieutenant, which again, no one liked followed by Kirk Douglas's offer to take over Spartacus after a week of shooting, uh, which I did. Yes, my narrative criticisms, which were at first so uh, enthusiastically received, began to grow pale as time went on due to the uh, counter-pressures of the writer Dalton Trumbo and Kirk's producer Eddie Lewis, who did not see eye to eye to me with me on the story. I was on the picture almost two years. Uh, only a f about eight weeks was spent in Spain doing the battles and the big march buys. <laughs> the whole picture was done on the back lot at Universal. It was interesting to, uh, from a purely uh, as an exercise, you know, to try to do scenes that uh, you thought weren't very good and to try to make them interesting. Uh, I thought the first 45 minutes of the film of the life in the gladiatorial school, which was simple, uh, turned out quite well as far as I'm concerned but then the rest of the story from the slave rebellion on to the end I thought seemed uh, a bit silly well during the making of Spartacus we bought Lolita Jimmy and I finally uh, Seven Arts a company named Seven Arts put up the money and we made it the only thing that is regrettable about the film is that Due to the incredible pressure against making the film by all sorts of groups. Although I think the film was faithful psychologically to all the characters and ca captured, I think, the sense of them. I think that the uh, total uh, lack of eroticism in the story, in this film presentation of it, spoils some of the pleasure of it. Um, you know, you can imply all the eroticism you want, but there's nothing like... Uh, delivering some to help understand a little more the enslavement, you know, that Humbert Humbert uh, was under. There was some criticism by some people that said that she looked too old, but uh, I never thought that was a valid criticism because the uh, it was one of those books where nobody bothered to really read the description that Humbert Humbert gave of Lolita. Because it's inevitably people imagined her as being about nine years old but I know that Lolita was uh, 12 years and three months when he meets her and then the story progresses through uh, quite a few years well Sue Lyon was actually just 13 when we made the picture and I thought this this criticism was not valid well I was interested in uh, whether or not I was going to get blown up by an H-bomb prior to uh, Lolita my uh, interest intensified itself sort of concurrently with that. I believe that um, the Berlin crisis took place during Lolita. And about that time, I became keenly interested and started reading up on all the, you know, literature of which there is a terrific extent, you know, a tremendous a lot. Boy, am I getting fucked up on this. A, a tremendous a lot. <laughs> I would say I pretty much read the, uh, the spectrum you know, I began finding after a while that I wasn't reading anything new, and I decided I knew the whole thing, you know. 
I came to London and started. You had the script uh, pretty well. Oh, the script was the script was uh, was done, and it was done in its black comedy form. A fact which uh, a certain amount of confusion has been created about. The script was done. Peter Sellers was cast. I never stop working on a script. I like to work with somebody else because under the time pressures that you're under, you can't afford the sort of uh, lapse of intensity that if you work by yourself, you might suffer. And uh, Terry seemed like an ideal person because the um, style of the uh, script was um, similar, you know, to his sense of humor. Well, I was very pleased with it. I mean, when you say a winner, I mean, I, th I, I thought it was a... I was very pleased with the film. It happened to also be... Um, a very successful film commercially. The depressing thing is that at every at every period of history, the uh, power structure and the uh, leaders always looked back on the previous uh, period of history and thought that they had learned something. I think that you know the old uh, thing about the only only thing you can learn about history is that you can't learn from history is is probably true, and that this uh, this illusion that you get that you're much more sophisticated and that you can never it can never happen that way again. May be true, uh, but the thing you don't realize is that it'll happen a different way. In praise of Arthur C. Clarke, uh, he he is, uh, I think, the most poetic uh, science fiction writer. He is scientifically the best informed. His narrative ideas, I think, are, for my tastes, the most appealing. He captures the uh, hopeless but uh, admirable human uh, desire to know you know, uh, these things that they never will, you know, can never really know, and to reach for things that they can never, you know, really uh, reach or reach back. And, you know, it, it's very hard to say it exactly, but the sense of sadness without uh, underlining it, there is a contrast in the story between uh, uh, giant orbiting bombs, which you might say is the uh, negative use of nuclear energy, and this particular spaceship which leads to um, uh, great, uh, fantastic uh, accomplishments, which is also another, the, the, good, the good use of nuclear energy.